on this Thursday night. Taxes, tariffs and trade across Canada and across the border. As North America's auto sector attacks Washington's latest tariff scare, Canada's premiers use a summer get-together to put Ottawa's carbon plan to the test. We look at what BC's experience could tell them. Also tonight, the U.S. president's latest invitation. Interesting timing, interesting guest. After days of trying to talk tough on Russia, Donald Trump opens the White House door to Vladimir Putin. The latest head spinner in a dizzying week. This is The National. The federal government wants it, insists it will get it, but Ontario is digging in on its opposition to the carbon tax, now joining forces with Saskatchewan to fight it in court. As Evan Dyer tells us, it's dominating talk at the Premier Summit that's underway in New Brunswick. Saskatchewan has a new partner in its lonely stand against the federal government's carbon tax. I'm pleased to announce that Ontario will join forces with Saskatchewan and use every tool at our disposal to challenge the federal carbon tax. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe says the whole climate framework agreed to two years ago by every province but Saskatchewan is starting to crumble. This made in Ottawa carbon tax plan finds our nation now in this position. We have two provinces in compliance, we have two provinces in court, and we have the rest of the country not meeting the federal carbon tax backstop. The situation is actually a bit more complicated than that. There are at least three provinces that look set to comply, two that intend to defy, and several that seem to want to fudge it. And it's that last group that could prove most difficult for the federal government. The courts will decide on Ontario and Saskatchewan, and most legal experts say Ottawa is probably on safe ground. This case is a long shot. Um, you know, nothing's impossible because judges are human beings, but based on the precedent of the last few decades, the chances of this winning are slim. The province's case will not stand up. Uh, so that is the advice that we uh, have been hearing. And so Premier Gallant says New Brunswick will comply. But Federal Environment Minister Catherine McKenna says she thinks New Brunswick's plan comes up short because it puts a price on carbon only for big emitters, not for ordinary consumers. Well, you know, with all due respect to, to Minister McKenna, I think she has other provinces that she has a lot more uh, trouble uh, convincing to put a plan in place. So I would respectfully uh, suggest to her that she focus on them. Then there's PEI. We've got a, a Prince Edward Island approach, which is to lower the price of renewables. And I think that's very interesting in terms of motivating people to uh, live up to our uh, climate change commitments. But again, no price on carbon, and that falls short of the framework agreement. So while only two provinces are openly defying Ottawa in court, there may be others where Ottawa ends up imposing a carbon tax. And politically, some premiers may prefer having Ottawa do it than having to do it themselves. Evan Dyer, CBC News, St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Now, British Columbia has had a carbon tax for a decade, and the province calls it a success. Emissions are down, the economy is growing. Renee Filipponi takes a look at the effect the tax has had on consumers. Peter Miller bought his first electric car five years ago. We're very concerned about the environment. He says people now are turning away from gas to save money. Do you know what the price of gas is, they say? I say, no idea. Well, it's close to $1.50 a litre, is it, at the moment? And that's the goal of a carbon tax make things like driving more expensive, and people will change their habits. The carbon uh, emissions levy that we, we put in place... A decade ago, Gordon Campbell's pro-business BC Liberal Party introduced the tax. Controversial at the time, it was the first of its kind in North America. It has been clearly a success. This UBC professor of economics believes a carbon tax is an efficient way to deal with emissions but admits it takes time to see results. Consumption per capita is clearly down, and of course we do have population growth, so in the end we're not saving quite as much as we would have liked. Between 2007, before the tax was implemented, and 2015, GDP in B.C. grew 17 percent. The province says net emissions dropped 4.7 percent, a decline but far from the initial 2007 target. The goal was to reduce emissions 33 percent by 2020. 
The current NDP government adjusted its targets this spring to give itself 10 more years and increased the tax from 30 to $35 per ton. Ultimately, carbon pricing has not had the negative impact on our economy that was predicted. Quite the contrary. We are doing very, very well. Everything from the apple you buy and eat to the apple computer you buy and use comes with an influx of energy. Critics argue for the tax to work, it needs to be much higher, but that would drive away investment. It means you need a very high tax, which people, A, will not tolerate, and B, which will be economically ruinous and so unsustainable. Wake up and smell the coffee. But for Miller, a self-described disruptor, he says change for the environment will come at a cost. It absolutely should be going up until it hurts a bit. That's the whole idea. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. There was a welcome surprise for beer drinkers from New Brunswick's Premier. Brian Gallant says it's time to overhaul cross-provincial barriers on alcohol purchases. I am uh, definitely willing to change New Brunswick's import level, yes. So Goliath says he's working to build consensus with his counterparts, which is a bit of a reversal. You'll remember just three months ago, the Supreme Court ruled in New Brunswick's favour in the so-called Free the Beer case, allowing the province to fine consumers for exceeding limits on alcohol brought in from other provinces. This trade within Canada was up for discussion in New Brunswick. The cross-border variety was on the table, Andrew, in Washington. Yeah, Ian, it was a critical hearing going on with huge potential effects right across this country. The focus, whether auto imports represent a threat to American national security and whether tariffs are the answer. But as Jacqueline Hansen shows us, opposition to that idea was strong, even from America's own auto industry. American-made vehicles arrived in the capital this morning, <laughs> driven by the auto workers who built them. Tariffs on autos and auto parts will raise costs for our customers and their families. It's part of a rare coordinated attempt by international and U.S. industry players to get Congress to see what's at stake if U.S. President Donald Trump follows through on his threat. There has not been a single company that I know of that has requested protection uh, in the form of tariffs. I'm mystified by the argument that uh, that imported cars and imported car parts are a threat to the national security. The real threat, many say, is to American jobs. A new report says if a 25% tariff is imposed on auto imports, sales would drop by 2 million, and more than 700,000 jobs would be wiped out. It also estimates consumers would face higher prices. At today's hearing, a representative for Canada said counter-tariffs would likely be triggered. Countries will retaliate, and that what that does is multiply the costs, multiply the losses. Canadian auto parts manufacturer Martin Rea has facilities around the world, but moving production to avoid tariffs would be too expensive. The reality is, is that's a ridiculous proposition. Uh, the cost uh, to do something like that uh, would be enormous. Some expect the anti-terror fight to go well beyond the hearing. If any other human being threatened your business as a going concern, you take legal action. My expectation is that's what will happen. There's hope here that these tariffs are just short-term negotiating tactics and that strong opposition will eventually change Trump's mind so that jobs at companies like this one stay safe. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Vaughan, Ontario. So there's consensus on both sides of the border. The tariffs could hurt the economy. Here's why the stakes are so high for Canadians. More than 2 million vehicles are produced in this country each year. That makes Canada's automotive industry the eighth largest in the world. The auto sector also employs more than half a million people here. And according to a TD Bank estimate, 160,000 of those jobs could disappear if tariffs came into effect. Well, let's turn to Parliament Hill now, where an NDP MP has been cleared of allegations of sexual misconduct. An independent investigator says Christine Moore did nothing inappropriate in a relationship with a former soldier. Tom Perry has reaction to the report. It was NDP leader Jagmeet Singh who ordered the investigation into Christine Moore. Today, Singh announced the results. The investigation has concluded that the allegations against Madame Moore were not supported by the evidence. A former soldier and Afghan war veteran, Glenn Kirkland, accused Moore of luring him into a sexual relationship and harassing him 
after he appeared before a parliamentary committee in 2013. Moore says she and Kirkland were lovers, that it was him who approached her. Today, she expressed relief at the investigation's findings. I never have a doubt about myself because I knew uh, the truth since the beginning, so it's why I'm not surprised about the conclusion of the investigation. Jagmeet Singh calls the investigation thorough. He says it heard from several witnesses, but one witness it didn't hear from is Glenn Kirkland. I've never gotten an opportunity to tell my side to the, to the NDP investigator. The NDP says Kirkland was offered a chance to speak, but turned it down. Kirkland says his lawyer at first told him not to talk about more, but that he later tried to contact the investigator anyway. If they're saying that I didn't participate, they're lying. Because why would I give a TV interview and not give an interview to an internal investigator? Kirkland says no one is denying he and Moore had sex. But with her an MP and him a witness before her committee, to Kirkland, there was an imbalance of power. That is what the fundamental issue is there, is she took advantage of her authority and her position. And if she was a male MP and I was a female soldier, look how differently that would act. You know, it would be a dramatic different conversation between me and you. And Tom Perry joins us from Ottawa. Where does the story go from here? Well, Ian, the story isn't over. Uh, Glenn Kirkland is being sued by Christine Moore uh, for libel and slander. Moore has launched legal proceedings against a, a number of media organizations as well, including the CBC. But uh, as far as Moore is concerned, uh, she's been cleared. Uh, Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, uh, today called Moore a powerful advocate for women in politics. He thanked her. Uh, for what he called her cooperation and patience uh, during this investigation. And he said that Moore uh, would now be able to resume her caucus duties uh, with the NDP. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Now for the latest chapter in an unpredictable saga that continues to grip the world, all about that enigmatic relationship of two powerful leaders. Today, Time magazine showed Donald Trump morphing into Vladimir Putin and then melded their faces into one to arrive at its latest cover. Quite a statement as the world wonders just how much their interests are aligned. For a few days, Trump tried to counter that image to some degree, but then today brought another startling move. Ellen Morrow shows us who was caught by surprise. The White House has announced on Twitter that Vladimir Putin is coming to the White House in the fall. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> you might expect the director of national intelligence to be informed of such an invite, to maybe even take part in the decision. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but Dan Coates was clearly blindsided. That's going to be special. <laughs> His shock is understandable. Remember this? He just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. The fallout from that statement rages on, even though President Trump has tried somewhat to walk it back. I said the word would instead of wouldn't. And today, more mixed messaging. Just before announcing the White House invite, the administration backed away from a Putin proposal to allow U.S. investigators access to Russians charged with election meddling in exchange for handing over U.S. officials to Russia for questioning, including former ambassador Michael McFaul. Trump initially applauded the idea. I think that's an incredible offer. What I was totally flabbergasted by was that the White House would not defend me. I'm an American citizen. I worked for the government for five years. The president was panned in the Senate today for not being harder on Putin. We do not buy the denial of Vladimir Putin. Uh, we regret that our president did. But Republican leaders refused to allow a vote on a resolution reasserting that Russia Mr. meddled in the 2016 election. The party whip defended the president. In Helsinki, he was less than clear about that, but he came back and said that he misspoke and reaffirmed his earlier position that, yes, the uh, 
Russian government had attempted to interfere in the election. And that's what makes the invite to President Putin so unusual. A man that even President Trump now says interfered in U.S. democracy, invited to the White House. A move that will only fuel further curiosity about what the two leaders discussed for more than two hours in that closed-door meeting. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Ellen mentioned former Ambassador Michael McFaul as someone President Putin wanted Russian investigators to interview. And in a moment, you're going to hear from another. Bill Browder was called out by name as someone Putin wants his agents to question in Russia. In post-Soviet Russia, Browder was a huge foreign investor, but he says corrupt officials siphoned off his holdings because he refused to pay bribes. Lawyer Sergei Magnitsky uncovered that money trail, was arrested, and died in a Russian jail. Since then, Browder struck back. He's championed the Magnitsky Act in the U.S. and six other countries, including Canada. It lets governments sanction human rights offenders in Russia and freeze their foreign assets. So let's talk to Bill Browder himself, joining us now from a location that we have agreed not to disclose. Because, Bill, the White House most recently has suggested that they will not hand you over to the Russians for questioning. Where does that leave you? Well, it doesn't leave me in that much of a different place than I was before, which is that for, for many years, I've been Putin's number one enemy. And as such, um, he's wanted to cause me harm, to kill me, to kidnap me, to arrest me, to extradite me back to Russia. And so I'm, I'm in a relatively precarious position, and I've got to do whatever I can to stay safe. And so I try not to, as best I can, um, give them opportunities. But um, of course, it is not pleasant to have the president making dirty deals in a back room with no witnesses with Vladimir Putin about me. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it there, but Bill Browder, I wanna thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Some of the other developing stories we are following tonight include a disturbing case just outside Toronto involving the attempted murder of a five-year-old. We're going to get to the bottom of this hopefully as fast as possible. We're glad that we were able to make the arrest today. Um, because of how, how big of like, a deal this is. This is completely unacceptable that this has happened to a five-year-old child. Police reaction today after the young boy was found unconscious with life-threatening injuries near a set of train tracks in Brampton. He had reportedly gone missing from his home overnight. A 28-year-old man has since been charged with attempted murder. Now, police wouldn't say exactly how he knew the boy, but neighbors told CBC News he's the mother's boyfriend. The boy is now in hospital in stable condition. Quebec police officer Patrick Ouellette was found guilty today of dangerous driving causing the death of a five-year-old boy. During a 2014 chase, he was driving more than 100 kilometers an hour in a 50-kilometer zone when he slammed into a car with two children in the back seat. Five-year-old Nicolas Thorne Bellance was critically injured and died days later in hospital. Well, that faces up to 14 years in prison. His lawyer says he plans to appeal. Still ahead on The National, who's allowed to play what role? The Hollywood debate continues this summer, reignited by The Rock's new blockbuster. We break it down with our pop culture panel. Plus, multiple wildfires are burning out of control in BC's Okanagan region. We'll show you the race to contain them and get people to safety. And the Senate says the federal government owes hundreds of thousands of women and children an apology after what are now being called forced adoptions. We'll bring you one woman's story. She was never in my life. I never got to celebrate a birthday with her or have a Christmas with her. It was, it's a tragedy and it just goes on the whole life. To date, there has not been an official acknowledgement by any level of government in Canada of the pressures that were put on unmarried pregnant women to surrender their babies for adoption and the pain that, and humiliation that it has caused them. Between 1945 and 1971, an estimated 350,000 Canadian women were forced to give up their babies for adoption simply because they weren't married. Ottawa even helped fund maternity homes where women were sent to to hide their pregnancies. And 
Today, senators called that a shameful period in Canadian history. They're asking the federal government to formally apologize to the victims, pay for counseling for the mothers and adoptees who need it, and call on provinces and territories to make it easier to release adoption files. Now, the Liberals don't have to accept the Senate's recommendations, but many hope they do, including Annette Marie Stokes. It's been more than 50 years, and she says she still can't erase the trauma of being forced to give up her baby. I had my daughter in 1965 in March, and uh, she was taken away from me immediately. After a couple of days, I'm watching all the other mothers with their babies, and I said, well, where's mine? And they didn't bring her to me. I said, well, I want, I want to see her, I want to feed her. And they would, they bound your, bre your, your, chat, your breasts with uh, cloth so that you wouldn't bond with the child. It was a collection of different people. It was the medical profession. It was Children's Aid who uh, they coerced me into writing, uh, you know, relinquishing her, writing, a, a, uh, signing a document that relinquished her. And they said that it would be uh, similar to, uh, the effects of this would be similar to if I had had a pet dog and it was run over by a car. And I, I'm I just to this day can, I'll never forget that statement that woman made. The trauma is, is, is severe. You're in a vacuum. It, it's as if you're in a kind of a vacuum and, uh, I don't know if I ever came out of that vacuum while I'm thinking about it. It was just uh, horrendous. I never had any other children, and many of these mothers never had any other children after, after the one. The apology is an acknowledgement. It's, it's saying, we, we did, this was wrong, we know it was wrong. It's just a whole chapter of my life that's gone. It's, it's gone. It's, they, they've taken your life away, really, basically, when they took that child away from me. As we mentioned, Annette is one of 350,000 Canadian post-war women who gave babies up for adoption. Do the math, and it meant an average of more than 1,000 cases per month during that 27-year period. We're still ahead on The National. A volatile situation in BC tonight as wildfires rip across the Okanagan. We'll bring you the latest. And extreme rhetoric calls for extreme parody, or does it? His lunchbox and push it into his tummy like this. Just remember to point Puppy Pistol's mouth right at the middle of the bad man. If he has a big fat tummy, point at that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen's latest show skewers politicians and public figures, but is it funny or frightening? Our pop culture panel discusses that next. It's not just the many faces of actor Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, Wagwan, Evertonari. It's the reactions his characters get from real people and the famous. So me idea is what? Need to make a drip proof ice cream. Can you please explain to him what I can't, I'm trying hard. Okay. Because he keeps telling me about buying a slave. We don't do that. I'm just dancing. Now Cohen's back with four new characters in Who is America? His famous face even more disguised. Sheket Sair, my name, Colonel Iran Morad. His guests, unaware they're part of an elaborate prank to get them to say outrageous things that may, and keep that in mind, may reflect an extreme version of their views. 
I would like you to help me do instructional video for three-year-olds. Just remember to point Puppy Pistol's mouth right at the middle of the bad man. So is this brilliant satire? Is it just comedy? Is it cruel pranksterism? Uh, a lot of people talking about it, and we're going to talk about it now with Sarah Bosfeld, a senior writer with Chatelaine. Stephen Marsh is a culture critic and author, and B. Kwame is a freelance writer who's written for Hazlitt, Ebony Magazine, and Vice. Pranksterism. I don't even know if that's a word, but you know what I'm trying to say, Sarah. What <laughs> well, do you think? He's a prankster, really. You know, his whole shtick is that he's going to come in and manipulate this image and really try to convince these people to say extreme things. The problem I have is that these extreme views are real. And in this climate that we're in, there's a lot of fake news, there's a lot of outrage. I think it, there is some value in putting a mirror up against some of these, these views that are quite extreme. You know, joking about having children be armed in schools is uh, is not really a joke after the school shootings that we've seen, but these Republican uh, politicians are willingly celebrating this idea, and I think that's something that we should be, that should be giving us pause, and it's not. Some people watching might think there's no way to disagree with that. Stephen has a way. Oh, I definitely disagree with that. I mean, I think the I think the thing about Sasha Baron Cohen is that, on the one hand, he is a genius. Like, and this show definitely captures his genius. He's one of the greatest clowns that's ever been. But what he does is really unnecessary right now, and it's actually kind of destructive right now because what he does is muddy the waters, and what he does is show, uh, you know, a parodic view of politicians, and he shows that, and he shows that you can manipulate images to really make people say, well, we already know that. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've already lived through all of that, and it, you know, comedy kind of is the fake news of the left, right, where you get, where you get this kind of line between what's just entertainment and what's actual news blurred. Well, just hang on a second, though. Fake news, I mean, that, those are fighting words around here. I mean, comedy's yeah. not fake news, comedy's comedy. But people go to comedy for news, and they go to comedy to get their political opinions, and they go to comedy to get their political opinions confirmed. And, and they're going in this context of the extreme manipulation of image. I would just point out that to make Republicans say insane things, you do not need elaborate ruses. You can read them in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, where they say things like, like, you know, they say things like there should be no fiat money, right? There should be no paper money in the world. Like, to, to, to make it parody actually diminishes uh, what they're saying, and it also takes away what we, re what we really read need right now. It's not more parody. We need more clarity. Oh, and nice. he provides the opposite of it. Thanks, Lion B. I'm going to come to you in just one sec, sure. but I want to play a, a clip here from the other Joe Walsh, uh, former congressman from Illinois, now a radio host, and, and here's, what, here's a little excerpt of what he said uh, on this show. The intensive three-week kindergarten course introduces specially selected children from 12 to 4 years old to pistols, rifles, semi-automatics, and a rudimentary knowledge of mortars. B, your reaction to that? You know what? It was just really difficult to watch and really difficult for me to find the, the comedy or the levity in it. On one hand, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about the idea of, you know, Michelle Obama's quote, when they go low, we go high. And there are some people who say with a show like this, you don't need to stoop to that level of that level of ridiculousness in order to make a point. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that 100% all the time. Sometimes I think you've got to fight fire with fire to, to push a needle. And I think that's what Sasha Baron Cohen thinks he's doing. But like what Steve said, right now it's, it's detrimental because it's just hopeless. It's not a time where you can watch something like this and turn off the TV and laugh about how ridiculous it is because you can open the paper and read something else that's utterly ridiculous that's happening in real life. And I think that the problem is Sasha Baron Cohen, his comedy and, and what he's trying to do has not really changed. And it's yeah. not a slight to him saying he hasn't evolved, yeah. but the world has changed. Yeah. So it's not fitting the way it used to fit. Because right now you look at something like this, I'm looking at this, you know, these jokes about children carrying guns. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like despair, it's hopelessness. So. Uh, quickly, I want to hear from all of you on, on, on this. Uh, so Joe Walsh, the guy that we just saw, uh -huh. he says uh, on CNN that he uh, was duped here, that what happened was 
The, uh, he got a call that he was uh, going to get an award from Israel in Washington. He flew from... You're looking so skeptical. <laughs> he, flew from, he flew from Chicago. This is a grown man. He, he this flew, is his excuse. It's amazing. So he flew from Chicago to Washington, and he got the award, and then he was put in front of a teleprompter, and he said a bunch of uh, complimentary things about Israel, a country he supports, and then they slipped this in. So he's, I feel like I'm not convincing you, or he's not convincing you. Does that change anything at all, that, that maybe this... Well, it was an elaborate ruse, and that does that soften at all the outrage that, that you have about this? No, oh, ridicule, these are well, yeah. these are. It just makes me sad that these people are not smarter. I mean, they are yeah. they are running p files of policy that affect exactly. people's lives, and they are making decisions on behalf of people who elected them. And so, if they are just willing to to just play into this elaborate ruse, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can't have been that elaborate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right? but, like. But it's, I sort of think it's sort of like what B said. It's like, did you, were, were you thinking like, oh, this guy has a lot of integrity? And he's really gonna, he's really gonna carefully scrutinize what he's reading on a teleprompter before he says it? You know, that's not what a Republican, pol any politician really in 2018, that's not what we think about it. And so he's essentially making fun of our antiquated ideas that we used to have about respect for public figures. We're going to switch topics that you can be really earnest about, and it's how charming Dwayne Johnson is, The Rock. And I'm going to ask you to make a choice here. Uh, your favorite Dwayne Johnson role of the three we're going to offer you, okay? Uh, Maui in Disney's Moana. Okay. Luke Hobbs in Fast and Furious. Uh, and The Tooth Fairy in The Tooth Fairy. Which is your favorite? Uh, Luke Hobbs. Right. Luke Hobbs gets it for me, so that's my fave. Why? Um, I just... I don't know, he's just made for that role. When this whole thing is over, we're gonna find a location, and I'm gonna knock your teeth so far down your throat, you're gonna stick a toothbrush right up your ass to brush them. Always nice to have The Rock on the show, but of course, we're mentioning him because, you guys, are you guys not fans? I'm, I'm a like big him. fan. Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't like The Rock? Yeah, apparently she doesn't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm just not buying tickets to his movies. So, and a lot of people, there are questions about who will buy tickets to Skyscraper, where he plays someone who has uh, lost a limb, had a limb amputated, and there's been uh, some controversy about whether uh, someone who hasn't had an amputation should be playing that role. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I mean, the discussion around inclusion and representation in Hollywood is at a fever pitch right now. And people are seeing there was the Oscars So White campaign that happened that really kind of pushed things forward and now has given the room for more people to have a voice and kind of have some more power around those discussions that happen. So it's not surprising to me that right now um, the communities of people with disabilities are looking at this movie and looking at this role and thinking that this is not a good idea. It's interesting that Dwayne Johnson, he has partnered with uh, an adv advocacy group mm -hmm. around getting people with disabilities uh, more recognition in, in Hollywood, and then he takes this role. And I think in Hollywood, sometimes to break that status quo, there's always this idea of, well, we need a big star to break this blockbuster summer movie, and I get that. But if you're going to be an advocate, how are you using your power to help other people and open doors for other people to have that representation? Because I understand actors want to act and take on different roles and they want that challenge, but I think we're really missing something authentic when we're not opening the doors for people who live those experiences to then bring that into the artistic realm. So You know what's interesting, though, is that in the social media reaction to this, mm -hmm. uh, there were some people who definitely took that view and mm -hmm. took it in, in a strident way, not in the thoughtful way that, that you've expressed it, but then there were also people who, some of whom had disabilities, and who said, uh, one in particular I remember seeing where, where a young person said, I was just thrilled to mm -hmm. see Dwayne Johnson playing that role, right. uh, and, and it made me actually feel good. Yeah. What do you think? It's such a fine line, because, I mean, you know, these representation questions are very real, and, 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 they're, and they're, very, they're very thorny and problematic, but, you know, ultimately, acting is about becoming another person. And, you know, all, you know makeup is not all blackface, right? Like, it's not... Where does this end? Like, where is the line? Like, are we going to get to a point where it's like, well, young actors shouldn't play old actors because that's ageism? I don't know. Like, I don't think there is actually a very clear answer mm -hmm. to me. I mean, I would say that, like, you know, this, for some reason, this didn't come up with Fury Road, where it was this, maybe that's because it was a futuristic thing. But um, on the other hand, like, at what point are we missing the point of acting, which is to be, inhabit the life of another person. 
um, which is inherently a problematic proposition and inherently one with power problems. Mm -hmm. um, and are we going to lose, are we just going to, you know, abandon that whole process uh, in the pursuit of, um, you know, of, of some kind of reconciliation that may not happen, you know? 45 seconds, last word to you. Well, I think the problem is that there's such power in media, movies, television, uh, to shape a culture and how people feel included in a culture. Yeah. And so it is really important to have authentic representation. And so I think it's a really good first step that Dwayne Johnson is actually engaging on these issues um, while taking this role. And I know people have an issue with him taking the role to start with. But what I would like to see next is so much more work behind the scenes and, and another film that comes out soon where it's, uh, you know, there really is an actor with an authentic uh, difference of ability that yeah. is in a role playing that character and and then maybe this conversation can facilitate that kind of you, machination you, behind the scenes i think mm -hmm. if maybe it'll lead to something good it in that be way a rock movie right like that's the thing it won't be the rock is the no, biggest star in the but world but it shouldn't be an independent art house film either it should be something that is still a, a large uh, movie house that is got real financial backing uh it doesn't have to be the blockbuster of the summer but it will really mean something to include um, these actors who are out there looking for work and are good actors. But then you're well, not going to have a blockbuster movie with a, you know, with a, a person with a what disability. What I'm saying is that it doesn't necessarily matter yet that it's a blockbuster movie. It mm. just matters that we're having this conversation now and that this movie is a legitimate movie, movie that people want to go see um, that maybe does have a, a, a star actor in it as well, but also has somebody who is in a breakout role. I feel I've lost control of the time here. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> so thank you guys very much. This is a great yes. conversation. We're going to do this uh, periodically on the program. My one regret is that we didn't get to you talking about Cher singing <laughs> ABBA songs, which, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a chance to do that okay. later. Sounds good. All right, thanks to all of you. <laughs> thank you. Crossing our fingers. Uh, next on The National, this summer, a growing number of Canadians are discovering there's trouble lurking in the great outdoors, and you might want to be prepared. The odd disease. You get some people who are just walking in, and they look perfectly fine, but they have it. Then you get other people coming in in a wheelchair. But first, a preview of a CBC short doc that you can watch right here on The National tomorrow. We'll introduce you to five guys who say when they walk down the street, they get stares, whispers, laughs. Strangers have even snapped pictures, all because of their dogs. You see a squirt? What's that? They're not real dogs. <laughs> They're not real dogs. Any anything smaller than, like, a lab is not a real dog. Well, give him a kiss. Be nice. Kiss, kiss. Yeah. Kiss, kiss. He must be a sweet guy versus a big biker type guy. It was love at first bite. I said bite, right? When I see a large man walking a small dog, I feel usually it's because he has to take care of it for his girlfriend. Normally, I think it's somebody that's looking to pick up women. Uh, I assume it's not his. It's probably his girlfriend's. I mean, why would a larger man have a small dog? You see a big, tough guy with a little poodle or something like that, you know? People start to think of these big guys as tough and whatnot. But, you know, sometimes they just want to roll around with a cute little puppy or whatever. Paul Bennett was an innocent victim. He was a completely innocent person. And um, I, I understand this is very unsettling news to the community. Tonight on The National, police in Surrey, B.C. revealed that last month's brazen shooting of a 47-year-old father of two was a case of mistaken identity. He was the unintended victim of a targeted shooting. Paul Bennett was shot to death in broad daylight right on his driveway. Today, his family made an emotional appeal for help in tracking down his killer. We never thought he would die in such a senseless and violent way. We are grieving and traumatized by his loss. One potential lead in the case is surveillance video of a silver Honda Civic leaving the area shortly after the shooting. Police are asking anyone who knows anything about that car to contact them. For the first time, the South Korean government has been held financially liable for a 2014 ferry disaster. It was ordered by a court today to compensate victims' families about $700,000 per victim. 304 people, many of them young students, were killed when that ferry sank. It later emerged that the ferry was overloaded and the rescue operation botched. 
Look at that, some dramatic video from Manhattan today. That's steam shooting out of the ground after a pipe exploded. Its force so strong, it sent chunks of concrete flying. Now, luckily, no one was seriously hurt, but 49 buildings had to be evacuated after authorities discovered that the busted pipe contained asbestos. New York's mayor says all nearby buildings and streets will now have to be decontaminated. And there was disappointment and perhaps you could say relief today at the opening of an ancient sarcophagus in Egypt. It was found this month at a construction site and there were hopes it might contain the remains of Alexander the Great. That was not the case. Archaeologists found three skeletons inside instead. But on the plus side, media fears that disturbing the tomb could trigger a pharaoh's curse, plunging the world into darkness, those appear to have been unfounded. It is tick season in Canada, and health officials across the country are warning to be on the lookout. The blood-sucking pests can carry Lyme disease, and it seems an increasing number of Canadians are being diagnosed. The Public Health Agency of Canada reported 144 cases in 2009. As of October of last year, that number had spiked to nearly 1,500 reported cases. Now, that could mean there are more disease-carrying ticks, or it could mean there's better awareness and testing. But as Kayla Hounsel shows us, it's got people on Nova Scotia's south shore taking extra precautions. When Caleb Morton plays with his dog in the woods near their home, there's a good chance she'll come in with ticks. But the day we visited, so did he. It was just kind of like in the inside, embedded quite good. Just the tiniest thing, just almost looked like a speck of dirt. She took her son to the doctor because she knows the tiny ones are the scary ones, the ones that carry Lyme disease. TikTok is pretty common around here. The damp coastal climate on Nova Scotia's south shore is perfect for the pesky parasites. It's also a stopover for migratory birds who might be bringing hitchhikers with them. Southern Ontario is also bad, but I do think south shore of Nova Scotia probably wins the Canadian uh, You Have Ticks contest, which is not necessarily a contest you want to win. Darian and Lucas Wallet both have Lyme disease. It can cause a range of symptoms, including a rash that looks like a bullseye, fever, headaches, and joint pain. I couldn't really move my legs at all. It would hurt a lot to move them. Just turn your head. It prompted their mother to take matters into her own hands. She's developing a natural tick spray to protect her sons and her neighbors. Honestly, almost every household that I've that on this street has had Lyme, knows someone who has Lyme, you know, has a, has a friend who has Lyme. Everybody's affected by it. She's working with researchers at Acadia University. So I'm going to take five of them. Nicoletta mm. Ferrone places ticks in the center um, of this petri dish. Yeah. The inner ring is treated with the tick spray. If the ticks don't cross, it means they're repelled by the spray. We found that uh, lemongrass essential oil body spray repelled between 75 and 85 percent of the tested ticks. They're working to improve the product and hope to get it registered with Health Canada. Such a mysterious, odd, odd disease. You get some people who are just walking in and they look perfectly fine, but they have it. Then you get other people coming in in a wheelchair. Fortunately, 10-year-old Caleb was treated with antibiotics. He's doing fine and not showing any symptoms of Lyme disease. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Martins River, Nova Scotia. And still ahead on The National, she was manipulated, abused, and kept it all in the dark. But last night, Morgan McCall and 140 other survivors of Larry Nasser's sexual abuse, they stepped into the spotlight in front of the whole sports world. What it meant for her is our moment of the day. But first... After a slow start to BC's wildfire season, more than 100 of them are now ripping across the province. The biggest are in the Okanagan. There are seven fires of note there, including one that just doubled in size overnight, forcing some people to flee. It's a little hard to see through the haze, but the hills around Peachland on Okanagan Lake are burning out of control. This is one of the biggest blazes in the province right now at 1,000 hectares. It's one of several that started on Tuesday after what residents described as an extreme lightning storm. Soon, dozens of properties were being evacuated as the flames crept closer. Families given little notice to grab what they needed and get out. Some even making the trek in the dark of night. 
grab the dog, grab whatever you can and head out. And when they're standing at your door, you don't really have time to do much, so I'm still in pajamas. After spending the night in their Jeep, Grant Andres checked in at this emergency support center. We're encouraging people that are on alert to pack up, you know, get their important papers together, any medications they need, um, you know, clothing. Alerts are a time to get ready to go. Meanwhile, the BC Wildfire Service says it is stepping up the firefight, adding more aircraft and ground crews. Uh, obviously, just trying to put them where they're going to be of the most good, trying to prioritize where our, uh, our efforts are going to be. But with strong winds in the forecast, they've got their work cut out for them. Little comfort to those waiting for news. Just nervous and anxious, you know, devastated a little bit if our house burns, you know, kind of crossing our fingers, hoping that it doesn't. That was a powerful moment last night at the SVs, an award show that recognizes excellence in sports. An army of gymnasts came together to accept the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage. This was the first time the women had assembled en masse since the sentencing hearing for Larry Nasser. They had all been sexually abused by the former doctor for USA Gymnastics. He's now serving 175 years for his crimes. Morgan McCall spoke to us about what it meant to stand on that stage with her sister survivors. And that is our moment of the day. I was really moving uh, to stand through. Receiving the award meant a lot personally uh, because it's something that some few people get to experience. But I think what makes it the, the biggest honor is that it stands for something so much greater than myself and even that group of women. Um, this is the largest platform that we've been given to show people that this isn't, isn't something to be ashamed about. In fact, it's something to be celebrated because we are reclaiming our voices. I think we really use the momentum of the event and the award itself to drive positive change. A lot of women, myself included, have been working on uh, grassroots activism relating to preventing this kind of abuse from taking place again. In reality, it's the beginning of something. And we're still seeking that justice from institutions who are complacent in Nasser's abuse. Um, and so I really encourage people to keep following along, keep the conversation alive, and keep standing by these women as we demand change and accountability. And Ian, you mentioned how this is the women's first time assembling since uh, Nasser's sentencing. But, but some of these, these women, these gymnasts, have been speaking out online, on social media for a long time. Ali Raisman is someone who I think of has spoken out in solidarity with other women, but also in anger, I would say, as well. So many people try to get attention for important causes, and every once in a while somebody does something brilliant. And having all of them there last night at ESPN's Sports Awards, so many sports fans watching that, and it was so powerful, and uh, we've heard a lot of uh, support for all the women who were standing there. That is The National for Thursday, July the 19th. Good night. Good night.